our Sydney campus pastor is going to be up here preaching and teaching and closing out our study on Leviticus. Next week, we start a new series called Faves. We're exploring some of our favorite passages of Scripture. Go ahead and let's check out this video about that series. Good to be with you all today. Um, I wanted to share something real quick with you. If you, as Pastor Ryan said, uh, we are starting the Sydney campus in t September 2023. I kind of had a bit of a panic attack this morning when I realized we're already like hoofing it through August and that next month it would be one year from now. Seems like a long time, right? It's not. <laughs> So I started getting that, and the Lord said, calm down, girl. I got all of it under control. And then he was like, you need to pray some more. That's what he said to me. You wouldn't be so worried about it if you prayed some more. So um, if you have shown an interest in the Sydney campus, even just a little bitty one, uh, this won't commit you to anything, but I think what we're going to do is start having some pop-up prayer walks. And so I will send out a mass text to everybody's um, phone that I have, and uh, we'll just pop up and do some prayer walks, uh, hopefully in the month of August, September, and uh, we'll just spend some time praying over the campus and over what God's going to do. So if you're interested in that, come see me after the service, send me an email, Facebook message, whatever works best for you. Well, the music this morning through worship was amazing, was it not? I mean, thank you, Donnie and team. I could have just like, okay, time to go home. I felt like I had, the Holy Spirit was here and ministered to. And I left my glasses down on the seat in front here. Is there anybody who can grab those for me and bring them up? I'm going to need them. Thank you so much. I knew one day I would do that. It's just something I thought, one of these days you're going to leave them lay there. Um, as I was preparing uh, this message today, I started thinking about my son, uh, my grandson Dylan, and softball. So he learned how to play softball this summer. That was the big event in our family. Um, they started out with practices, and then they went from practices to a game or two a week, and it was so exciting. Wayne and I tried to go to as many of his games as we could to just love on him, support him. And at the beginning of the games, at, well, practice, it started at practice, at the very very beginning of the season, very few of them could catch a ball. They didn't even know what hand to put their glove on. And then there were quite a few of them that could not hit a ball, no matter how hard they tried. They would forget their mitts. They would go out on the, out on the outfield and wouldn't have their glove. And then they'd have to run back to the dugout, get their glove, because they realized they needed that to catch a ball. Sometimes they cried. That was always sad to see. And all through this, teaching them how to connect, how to catch a ball, what to do. What, through this whole time, their coaches were amazing. They were so patient with them. They explained things to them over and over and over. They, some of them were there, these little kids, boys and girls, it was a co-ed team. Some of them were there because they loved baseball and maybe their dads, moms, brothers, sisters, whatever, had taught them how or played with them. They were there for the game and then there were a whole lot of them there. They were there for the snacks after practice. I was there for the Kona ice truck, I will admit it. Wayne would be come and he'd be all into the game, you know, and say, you know, telling me all about it, and I'm just like getting my money out for the Kona ice truck. 
about three quarters of the way in, I noticed that something seemed to be shifting with the team. Things were starting to click for the kids. They started scooping up the ball when it came to them. And here was the big thing. They knew where to throw it, where to throw it once they got it. Because they had been standing there in the beginning with it, like, what do I do? Where does it go? Well, then I'm noticing they're scooping it up and they're throwing it right where it needs to go. They start connecting with the ball, hitting it. Dylan hit a home run. He hit the ball. He ran to first base. He ran to second base. We're on our feet. He ran to third base. And he ran into the dugout. <laughs> no kidding. So technically, it wasn't a home run. It wasn't even a run. I had so many people say, well, they should give it to him. He didn't get a run. But it was so excited. Everybody was screaming and shouting, some for different reasons. Um, but it was, it was so fun. And so today, we're wrapping up a six-week series on Leviticus. I don't know how many of you would say, it's so fun. Um, but good job. You stuck through it. You made it back. And it reminds me of Dylan's uh, baseball this summer. Most of us, when we started out, had no clue what Leviticus was really all about. I mean, maybe we would read it a few times, but you know how if you're doing the Bible in a year, you're just kind of reading through it really quick. Cause you, and so you get to something like Leviticus, and you're like, yep, 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 yep. Because it's like rules, regulations, weird things. And you're like, none of this applies, and you're just flicking right through it. But we kept showing up. We kept listening to the messages. We kept leaning into the Holy Spirit when he would speak to us. And I have watched it start to click. Even for pastors, it's not a book that we all get excited about reading and, and um, preaching on. You'll rarely hear Leviticus taught, actually. But I hope that today at this end, that the main message, the bottom line of Leviticus has been etched into your heart and into your mind. It is Leviticus 19.2, be holy for I am holy. Be holy for I am holy. We have learned that God is holy. So under the Old Covenant, they needed sacrifices to purify them before a holy God. Under the Old Covenant, they needed priests to intervene on their behalf, to approach God on their behalf. Under the Old Covenant, we learned about the two goats. Do you remember that one? That was my favorite chapter. The two goats, there was a, a, a goat, that, and they would bring the goats to the priest. And the first goat was the sacrificial goat. And that's the goat that they would kill and the blood would be sprinkled and they burned and, and sent up the sacrifices. And the second goat was called the scapegoat. And that was the goat, I, I just see this picture so clearly in my mind, that was the goat that they would take the sin and symbolically place it on this goat's head. And then the priest would lead the goat out into the far edges of the camp. And then they would turn it loose, and it would run and run and run far away, forever gone. And that was the one that came so alive to me. Psalm 103 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. I love Psalm 103 because it paints such a beautiful word picture for us. It's saying that first verse is, that's how much God loves you. We can't even measure it. If we try to say he loves you this much, it, it won't be enough. It will not encompass how much he loves you. So they use the, the hot heavens, the distance between the heavens and the earth, and that's how much God loves you. And because he loves you that much, he removes your sins, your transgressions, as far as the east is from the west. In other words, run, goat, run. They release that goat. He goes and he goes and he goes, and the sins are remembered no more. We learn that holiness means that we are to be different. 
Holiness means being set apart. That when we live sold out for God, then you're going to live differently than others around you. We learned that holiness is a high bar. It requires more of us. We're called to live lives of sexual purity. We're called to love others without conditions. We're called to set a priority on the worship of a holy God. That message was one that stood out to me as well. And I remember um, as we were walking through how, how, we are, how the Israelites were to worship their holy God, and, and we had to internalize that and say, how do I worship my holy God? And God spoke to me and he said, you need to do a little better at that. And I knew, I, I talked to him, prayed about it, and God was impressing, impressing upon me that I needed to spend more time just quietly in his presence. And then he said something I did not like, you need to get up earlier. I am not a morning person. And it was like, you need to get up before the sun comes up. And I'm like, what? Who does that? Get up before the sun comes up and just sit in my presence and worship me and let me speak to you and guide you. We are called to extend hope to people in need. We're called to give freedom, fight for freedom for those who are oppressed. So the question that I ask you this morning as we wrap up this book, as we come to the ends of chapters 1 through 26, the question is, are you any different than when we began? Are there things of holiness that has gripped you and you want to please God? You want to make some changes to please him. Are there things that you've turned away from? Have you made restitution where needed? Have you gone to the person that you've sinned against or you've wronged and have you made it right? And this was one for me, I'm going to share my stories today in the, in the messages. It's not all about me, but he spoke to me so much through this book that I want to share with you. During the series, the Holy Spirit brought something to my mind that I had completely, totally forgotten about for years and years. I was in college, and there was a girl in my hall, and she had something <laughs> She did something with what she had, and it just highly annoyed me. Now, truth to be told, listen, there's absolutely no justification for what I did. No justification at all. One day, my roomie and I, we were just like, does that annoy you as much as it annoys me? Yeah. Well, let's do something about it. So, like stupid 18-year-olds, we walked down the hallway, and we took this thing out of her room. Now, if you had said to the young Cindy then, if you had said, J you know that's stealing, right? You've been raised, you know better than that. I would have said to you, it's not stealing. We are going to give it back. It's just a fun prank. But it quickly got out of hand. It escalated and it turned into something big. And instead of admitting what we had done, we went silent. Two weeks later, it was summer break, and we left college, and I never saw this person again. I completely forgot about it until 35 years later, I was on Facebook. And guess who was there? You know how if you're friends with friends of a friend, right, and their profile pops up, and there she was. And it all started coming back to me. I replayed that day in my mind, but I was replaying it in my mind as an adult woman, and I thought to myself, I can look back at her reaction. It was as if it was yesterday. I can look back at her face and how she responded to that, and she felt extreme hurt, and she was so embarrassed, and it would have also been financially costly to a young college student. And I felt this sorrow rise up in me for something I had done 35 years ago. 
I knew I had sinned against her, and our scriptures that we've been learning, we know that when we sin against someone, we're sinning against God. And we learned in Leviticus that the first thing required of those who trespass against another is confession. Leviticus 5.5 tells us, when anyone becomes aware that they are guilty in any of these matters, they must confess in what way they have sinned. And if you say to me, well, Pastor Cindy, you know, that's the Old Testament stuff. Well, let's look at the New Testament. It tells us, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift, Matthew 5. So I had to reach out to her and ask for her forgiveness. And boy, that was not fun. It's not always the response you want. Let me just take a break right there and remind you that we do what God calls us to do. We make it right. We confess. We ask for forgiveness. And then it's up to the other person what they do with that. And so it's not always the response you want. And then after I asked for her forgiveness, I needed to make amends. Restitution, hear this. Restitution is an important part of repentance. They must make restitution in full, add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the owner on the day they present their guilt offering, Leviticus 6. Here's what the New Testament tells us. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So I knew that even though it had been 35 years ago, I needed to confess, I needed to make restitution. So I prayed about it, and I felt the Lord was saying to me, it, this won't, she doesn't need this now, but here's what you need to do. And so I sent a gift, an offering, to um, an organization that ministers to young girls. And then I went before God, and I asked for his forgiveness. I asked for his forgiveness for sinning against her and for sinning against me. And you know, we tell ourselves sometimes, especially if any time has passed, that you know what, that's awkward. You don't need to do that. Why don't you just, you know, make it right between you and God and move on. Maybe you're going to bring up bad memories. Maybe you're gonna, and sometimes that might be the case, but in this case, I knew. And God, if you ask God, he will make it clear to you exactly the path you need to take. What do you need to ask forgiveness for? Because your soul wants to please God. I have to be honest with you. In that moment when I was doing all of that, all I wanted was to make it right with God. Are there sins you've turned away from because you've had a glimpse of the purity and the holiness of your God? That's what we've talked about this whole, uh, up to six weeks of Leviticus, about the holiness of God and the purity. And as we've walked through the Bible, uh, the, this book of the Bible, how have you responded to it? How have you responded? Have we walked through it and ignored it and just went home and went about the rest of our week? James 1.22 tells us, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. In other words, when God speaks to you about something, when he makes something clear to you, act. It requires action. We've learned some good stuff over the last five weeks. We've learned that because Christ died on the cross for our sins, we don't have to bring animal sacrifices anymore. Woohoo! Isn't that a good one? I'm so grateful. We've learned that we don't need a priest because Jesus, the Lamb of God, washed us clean, and he is our perfect priest. We have direct access to God. We can approach him face to face. And we've learned that he still today calls us 
to be a holy people. This wasn't just for the Israelites. This is for you and I today. First Peter 1.15 says, as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. And then we come to chapter 27, the last chapter in the book of Leviticus. Some get to this last chapter and they think it stands out like a sore thumb. They think, how does this chapter connect to all of this? While all of uh, verses one through 20, or chapters one through 26 had a whole lot of rules and regulations and um, sacrifices and offerings and all the details, w- w- we get that. It was a, a people learning how to be holy in, to, uh, in front of a holy God. They wanted to live fully in his presence. We get all that. So he made this way for them to be still called his, but what does chapter 27 have to do with all of that? Because on the surface of chapter 27, it reads like a tax chart. But if you let chapter 27 read you, it drips with God's grace. On the surface, it looks like valuations of lands and houses and animals and people, but when you let it read you, when you say to God, Lord, what do you want me to know about this? What are you speaking to? Show me something here, Lord. Reveal to me what you want me to know. When you read for information, that's good, that's important, but you read for transformation. If I could sum up chapter 27 with one word, it would be the word grace. The grace of God is his choosing to bless and favor us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. That's what grace is. Grace is not getting what I deserve. Leviticus chapters 1 through 26 are all about what God did for the Israelites so that they could be a people in his presence. Chapter 27 is when the grace of all of that seems to start sinking in. It's like an aha moment. The light bulb goes off. They, not, they just don't want to offer sacrifices to God. They don't just want to um, give offerings to God, things that were required of him. In chapter 27, it's about vows. You'll hear some translations talk about dedication, consecration. The people are making vows to give or dedicate above and beyond what was required of them in in books 1 through 26. That's what chapter 27 is. God has brought the Israelites from slavery into freedom. He's continued to protect them. He's continued to bless them. He's continued to guide them. And so they want to be extravagant toward God because he has saturated them. He has saturated them with his grace and his goodness. And they just want to give more of themselves to him. God is in their midst, and that creates an overwhelming excitement. That's the byproduct of what people do when they encounter God and his grace and his goodness. When you and I truly understand the cost that Christ paid for us, when we truly understand the grace that he pours out on you day after day after day, situation after situation, choosing to give us what we don't deserve, our response will be extravagant devotion to him. What other response could we give? What other response is worthy to such grace but extravagant devotion with our hearts, our mind, and our soul? And people who have an extravagant devotion to God, they are extravagant with all that they have. Years ago, one of Wayne and, and my dreams 
Um, you know, you got bucket lists, you got dreams, you, you, this, you'd love to have that, you'd love to have this. And like everybody else, we did that. And I mean, for years, one of our dreams was to have a vacation home near the ocean. We just thought that would be just so amazing, right? Of course it would be. We would go on vacation and uh, if we were on the beach or near the ocean, we would think, oh, what would it be like just to be able to live around here and live this all the time? Wouldn't that be amazing? And then we come back to reality. We go home. And I mean, for years, you have to understand the context of this. For years, Wayne and I rented a home because we were not able to afford to purchase a home. So our dream, our real dream was just to own a home, much less a, a vacation home. And one day, we found ourselves doing just that, owning a home near the beach. And we walked around pinching ourselves. Oh, wait. I walked around pinching Wayne black and blue. Like, is this for real? Is this for real? Is this really our life? Because we knew. We knew that no matter how hard we had worked, we knew how matter how diligent we were with our finances. We knew that how, um, no matter how faithful that we had been with our giving, that it was all God. That we had to give God all the credit. We could take no credit for anything good that we had in our lives. That God in all of his goodness and all of his grace, he deserved all the credit. James 1.17 tells us every good action and every perfect gift is from God. These good gifts come down from the creator of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Do you ever look at what you have? I don't care how big it is, how small it is, how expensive, not expensive, whatever you have. Do you ever look at it and do you say to God, this is yours? this is yours. What are your plans for it? God, what do you want to do with this? I learned a long time ago that as long as my hands were like this with everything, with my kids, my marriage, my stuff, my finances, my everything, that it was all his and that the minute I felt my fingertips curling up was the minute that I knew I had to be radically generous. No matter it, what size it is, no matter what it is, no matter what your dreams are, no matter how hard you've worked for it, do you say, Lord, this is yours. This is your house. This is your business. This is your marriage. These are your kids. This is your college degree. This, uh, everything is yours, Lord. This is your talent. What do you want me to do with it? What do you want me to do with it? We determined that if God was going to bless us with that house, then we would bless others with it. And so we invited um, pastors and their families to come stay at the house at no cost. It, it, people in the ministry don't get paid a lot, and um, often if you, took, if you had a family and you wanted to take a vacation at the beach, it was unaffordable for people, so we opened it up for pastors to do that with their families. We opened it up for pastors to come and take sabbaticals. There was a couple who were in ministry, and they'd had a devastating accident, and it was destroying their health. It was destroying their family. It was destroying the marriage, everything about it, and um, they just needed to get away and focus on each other, and heal that marriage, and so they came to the house. And I don't say any of this to give any pats on the backs or say, oh, look what we did, or look what we had. Absolutely not. We knew that it was all because of God. And after five years, it was time to release it and give it up. And people would say to us, well, why? I, I can't tell you how many people wanted to give me instructions on how we could still keep it. And Well, why don't you try this? Well, what if you did that? Well, how about this? How about that? And then you could keep it because you don't want to give that up, do you? We're like, yeah, it's time. It was never ours to begin with. And today, I thought it's not ironic that today as Wayne and I are looking for a home to, to move into, to buy here in Sydney, um, it's not ironic to me that we're living in somebody else's house. 
a house that they feel very blessed to have, and they have loaned it to us for as long as we need it because they know it's not their house. It never was to begin with. You see, in chapter 27, the Isra Israelites have realized, they've realized who they're called to be. They've realized who God is, and they've realized that it's only because of his goodness and his grace that they have the ability to live in the presence of a holy God. Andrew Bonar, an author, summed it up like this. He said, this chapter, he's speaking about Leviticus 27, he says, this chapter is about the people expressing their devotion to God freely and fully beyond the call of duty and the menace of required obedience. They're expressing generosity. They're expressing extravagance. They're expressing devotion to God way over the minimum requirement. And we have to ask ourselves today, am I serving him at just the minimum requirement? Am I just getting through with the basics? He says, lovers delight in giving gifts and do not feel constrained to limit them to the predictable occasions of birthdays and anniversaries. Love motivates them to give spontaneously and extravagantly. Since God has set out the good news of his law for Israel, would God's people not want to stand back with adoration and gratitude and ask, what shall I return to the Lord for all of his goodness to me? Let's inventory. Let's inventory this morning about what we have. What do you have right now all because of God's grace? Have you been forgiven? Have you been set free from your sin? Are you like me and when you read that chapter in Leviticus, you were like, run, goat, run. I was like standing up going, run, run far, far away because I know what my sins are. Like the Israelites, have you been set free from bondage, addiction, fear, finances, shame? Have you been healed? Has God healed you, brought healing to your life? You see, Leviticus 27 on the surface looks like transaction. But the book of Leviticus is all about a relationship with a holy God. We tend to focus on everything that we want, everything that we wish we had, everything that we don't have. We, we focus on what other people have when in truth we have been blessed in so many ways. And so if the old covenant people of God would be moved to such extravagant generosity in every area of their life, then how much more should we? Think about it. We're the new covenant people. They had animals sacrificed and grain. We had the Son of God sacrificed for our sins so that we would be set free and that we could walk with a holy God and have a relationship with him. As we close up the book of Leviticus today, I just want us to take um, inventory, take a little evaluation I'm going to ask you uh, if you'd bow your heads. And when I do that, it, it's nothing weird. I'm just asking you to put your head down so you can think about it. I'm asking you to put your head down and focus and tune out all the distractions, even me up here. Focus on God. Maybe this book of Leviticus and the call to be a holy people before a holy God is calling you to recommit somewhere in your life. Maybe God is telling you, you need to recommit to faithful worship, where I am first in your life, not the screen, not the TV, not the job, not money, not whatever, a relationship. I am first in your life. Maybe it's faithful worship attendance, 
where we put the gathering of the body together and, and that is important to us, uh, more important than the things of the world. Maybe it's recommitting in our giving and our generosity. May, maybe you tithe and, and God's saying, you know what, I want you to give above and beyond. There's so much more that can be done for the kingdom. Maybe it's to commit to serving others. It's been hard these last years to serve others because we don't like them too much, do we? He calls me to that often. I'm like, Lord, but I don't like them. And he's like, but serve them anyway. I don't know what it looks like for you. Some of you, it may look like you've never surrendered your life to Christ before. And you've been hearing about this grace and this goodness and you want to experience it. Did you know that the Israelites, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness? All the while, they were only 11 days away from their destination. They just kept going round that mountain and round that mountain. I don't want you to wander for 40 years in the wilderness without Christ when there's a direct path to him right now. You can ask God to forgive you of your sins and you can start a fresh new life with him right this moment, right where you're sitting. And you can experience what it feels like to be in relationship with a God who is so good. Would you stand with me? And we're going to close out here. And I'm going to have you do something that well, I showed you earlier, I do, it, I do it often, but if you're comfortable, just reach your hands out as we pray. Just reach your hands out and um, let the Holy Spirit show you where he wants to do a work in your life or what, a, a, an exciting thing that he has for you or whatever it is and just have open hands to him, a posture of complete sur surrender. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I am praising you today for that ancient book that we just have passed over so easily because it just didn't seem like it had anything for us. And yet, Lord, it holds the story of your holiness and who you are. And God, this morning we worship you. We worship you, holy God. We come before you and, and we, we just... We offer our lives to you. We surrender to you, Lord, all that we have. May we be a people, Lord, that are a holy people. May we be a people that those around us in the communities of Troy and Sydney and Piqua and all in between and around, Lord, that we would be a people that they would say, that is love. Those are people who care about us. Those are people who are different. We don't know what it is about them, but they're just different from the rest. May we be that people, Lord. Father, I just thank you. It's all I have. I just have thankfulness and gratitude in my heart. We have felt you in our presence this morning. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We were talking this morning. We said we're not going to dismiss you. We're going to send you out. We're going to send you out today to go out into your world and just be generous, giving, loving people. Have a great Sunday. Thank you. Thank you.